Good morning. Some announcements before we begin our worship service this morning. Just a reminder, this will be recorded and posted on YouTube for our, our members who are not able to be here this morning. Um, and I always like to take this chance to remind us that um, even though it's a great um, tool for when we can't be here or for those who can't make it, um, it's also a really excellent tool for being able to share the gospel and the Lord's message and his light through the week with anybody, co-workers, family, anyone that we encounter. It's a great way to you know, direct them to the YouTube channel, to the website, and um, they are available. I believe we, we've kept on the YouTube all of the sermons since we started recording this over a year ago, so um, it's a great way to kind of hook someone and maybe get them binging a little bit. That's our the way of society now, right? We can say, okay, and let that next one roll. Um, but we're just very thankful for all those who have put the work into getting that set and continuing the work. Um, we have our communion packets in the back. Um, if you do not have a communion packet, if you can go ahead and raise your hand at this time, we'll make sure um, we get them, get one to you. And just keep it on up until um, someone has, has brought you one. Um, there are packs available in the tote in the carport if you have need or for when you're not able to be here, if you're, if you're worshiping with us at home right now. Um, if you need them and can't come pick them up, please just let one of us know. We'll make sure you have what you need. Um, a reminder about our Wednesday night Bible study. The, uh, the Zoom link is on our website at uh, uticachurchofchrist.com. That's at 7 p.m. And we're very thankful to have Sunday School back uh, at 9 a.m. in person here. Um, we've been doing that in the auditorium, and it's been a, a wonderful thing. We have uh, Sunday School in the classrooms for the kids. Um, we're very thankful for those who have stepped up to get that going again. Um, we have uh, in our prayers, uh, please keep... Sue's daughter, uh, Laura, and her sister, uh, Carol, in our prayers. Uh, we're thankful to announce at this time uh, a new addition to the family, a great-granddaughter named Josie, born on Friday. So we're very thankful that mom and baby are both doing well. And um, we also have a, a thank you uh, card from Sue. Uh, dear church family, thank you for all the prayers for my daughter and sister. They are both healing and doing well. I love you all, Sue Phillips. So we're just happy to continue praying with our sister and um, and being able to lean on each other, we're so thankful for that ability. I'll have this posted in the back. Um, please keep Paul Sturgis in your prayers as he uh, has started physical therapy. Uh, also, Melissa's mom. Um, Catherine uh, Gervin has requested prayers for her brother Gordon, who was diagnosed with liver ca cancer. Um, also, uh, Julie... Randy's uh, sister-in-law is having heart issues, but she is doing much better now. We heard this morning, so we're very thankful for that. Um, Kenny and Sally are, are continuing to um, have to make decisions and, and take actions regarding uh, uh, moving and, and changing um, based on the, the situation at their apartment complex. So please keep them in your prayers uh, for a resolution to that and for and for peace and comfort as they go through uh, that challenging time. Um, I would also like to pray for uh, Paula's dad, who is in hospice. Um, please continue to pray for her and their family, um, and also the family of uh, John Reynolds' uh, neighbor who recently passed. Um, at this time, I'd also like to ask uh, prayers for uh, my little cousin, Christina, Bronson in Florida. Um, we just received word minutes ago that um, that she was just taken to the hospital uh, with COVID. She is having trouble breathing. They're um, they're not letting her husband there. Um, it's she's really scared right now. She is uh, fully vaccinated. Uh, he is, but he's a first responder. Um, we're just uh, asking prayers for our family, for their family, for her. Um, and that's Christina Bronson in, in Florida. Uh, if you would bow with me for a word of prayer. Um, 
Heavenly Father, we come to you at this time thankful for the opportunity to be here to worship. We thank you for those who have prepared to help carry out this service. Father, we pray you be with those on our prayer list. Pray you be with each of those battling through the trials of this life, Father. We know that we can look to you for comfort. We can look to each other for comfort. We pray that we carry ourselves in a way that lets people know that they can look to us for comfort. And we pray that when they do so, we guide them, to, we, we direct them to you. Father, we pray you be with each of us as we are about to partake of this worship service and that we carry out in a way that is pleasing to you, that clears our minds and clears our focus and that we can bring our troubles to you and then let them go, Father. We know that that is not easy for us to let go, but we pray that we continue to grow in our faith and our trust in your grace and your power and, and goodness that we do, Father, that we just do. Let go and give our cares to you. Thank you again for the opportunity to be here in Christ's name. Amen. Good morning. The songs for this morning are on my left. If you would turn with me to hymn number 98. Number 98. Oh, how I love Jesus. After this song, we'll have our scripture and prayer. This morning is taken from the book of Esther, Esther chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. I'll be reading from the Revised Standard Version. Esther chapter 3. After these events, King Assyrus promoted Haman, the son of Hamadatta, the Agatite, Agagite, and advanced him and established his authority over all the princes who were with him. All the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman, for so the king had commanded concerning him. But Mordecai neither bowed down nor paid homage. The king's servants who were at the king's gate said to Mordecai, why are you transgressing the king's command? Now it was written, when they had 
Now it was when they had spoken daily to him, and he would not listen to them, that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's reason would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai neither bowed down nor paid homage to him, Haman was filled with rage. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for he had told him, for they had told him who the people of Mordecai were. Therefore, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, who were throughout the whole kingdom of, Has- of Hasuerus. In the first month, which is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Hasuerus, Pur, that is, the lot, was cast before Haman from day to day and from month to month until the twelfth month, that is, the month of Adar. Then Haman said to King Hasuerus, There is a certain people scattered and dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of all other people, and they do not observe the king's laws. So it is not in the king's interest to let them remain. If it is pleasing to the king, let it be decreed that they be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who carry on the king's business to put into the king's treasuries. Then the king took his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. And the king said to Haman, the silver is yours and the people also. Do with them as you please. Will you please bow with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning thankful, dear Lord, for this awesome opportunity we have to gather here to worship you together, dear Lord. We are blessed to be your children. We are thankful, dear Lord, to be your children. We are thankful, dear Lord, for the opportunity to come out and worship you. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, that our worship service this morning is uplifting and edifying to everyone here, but most of all, dear Lord, we pray our worship is acceptable to you. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you will be with those who were mentioned in the announcements who are struggling with their health. We pray that you will heal them, dear Lord. We pray that you will take away their pain. We are thankful for those who are doing better, dear Lord. We pray that you will continue to watch over your children. Dear Lord, we always, we pray for your guidance. We pray for your wisdom. We pray for the, the courage, dear Lord, to follow your wisdom. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you will continue to watch over this congregation, guide us, forgive us, dear Lord, when we fail. These things we pray in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen. Before we partake of the Lord's Supper, let's sing hymn number 180. Number 180, in memory of the Savior's love. <clears throat>
church. Hopefully everyone has secured a uh, communion packet. This is the body and the blood of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. This is for those who have been baptized into the body of the Church of Christ and is continuing in the faith. This morning, I would like to read into your hearing <clears throat> passages from the book of Matthew regarding the Lord's Supper. Uh, that is Matthew chapter number 26, starting at verse number 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and he gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. At this time, we can peel back the top layer of our communion packet to expose the bread as we go to our Heavenly Father and thank him for the bread. Merciful Father in heaven, a few of your faithful servants bow just now, thanking you, Heavenly Father, for this day. We're thankful, dear God, just now, and mindful of your son, Jesus, who came down from your right hand, came down, bled, suffered, and died to give us a right to the tree of life. Dear God, we are, pray that you would bless this bread, this loaf, which represents the body, and we pray that we would take it in a manner that is pleasing and acceptable unto thee. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now open up the second layer to expose the fruit of the vine. And let us go to our Heavenly Father again. Dear God in heaven, again, we're so thankful, Father, for your son, who again came down and bled, suffered, and died on that cruel cross of Calvary on our behalf, dear God. At this time, Father, we're thankful for this fruit of the vine, and we ask that you would bless it, Father. This fruit of the vine represents the blood, Father, and again, we ask that those who will be partaking of it would do so in a manner pleasing and acceptable unto thee. It's in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen. Separate and apart from our communion service, we are also commanded to, to give each first day of the week. We have this opportunity just to give a small portion back, to do it uh, cheerfully, and we realize that how, how good our, our Savior is and how much he blesses us and takes care of us. And again, he just asks for a small portion back. So at this time, we'll have that opportunity um, to give. Let us bow. Father God in heaven, 
we're so thankful to be on time side of life and we thank you for having the opportunity to come together and collectively worship you in spirit and in truth. At this time in our service, Father, we pause to give back a small portion. We pray for these funds that will be collected, dear God. We pray that they will be done, it will, the giving will be done, Father, cheerfully, uh, not of necessity. Uh, we pray, Heavenly Father, that we will utilize these funds to continue to do your will. Guide us in that area, dear God. We pray that you would just continue to bless us as your children bless us here at the Utica Church of Christ, Father. May we do all we can, Heavenly Father, to let our light shine, Father, to spread your word outside of these walls, Heavenly Father, to save souls. We're asking, dear God, that you would continue to be with us and bless us, be with us through the furtherance of this service. May everything that we say and do be to your honor and to your glory. It's in Jesus' precious name that we pray and that we ask it all. Let the church say amen. If you would at this time mark your song books, uh, the White Songs of Faith books at hymn number 16. Hymn number 16, Restore My Soul. will be the song of invitation after this morning's lesson. It's not a great way to mark them, so you can put something in there or just look up at the board. Or remember, I don't know. 16, Restore My Soul. And once you have that marked, turn with me to 699. Say good morning to you. It's 
a beautiful song. I think our brother Jeff Johnson taught us that song, didn't he? Memories. I've been here a long time. <laughs> uh, this morning, I want to say how great it is to see everyone here. Great to be here to be able to worship our Heavenly Father in spirit and in truth together. Great to be able to experience Sunday school together, to learn more of God's word together, to attempt to all have the same mind and the same purpose and same aim, and then to be able to come out and to render unto the Lord what is not only acceptable, but what is, is due to him. We're going to continue this morning, uh, as it was read to us, uh, in our study on the book of Esther. And we want to, from chapter 3, talk on the subject, corruption and the ugliness of man. Uh, corruption and the ugliness of man. I think when we look at this uh, passage of scripture, that we are able to see the timeless uh, nature of God's glorious word. And so um, pray that we all have an open mind and open hearts to God's word. Now let's go to God in prayer. Our God and Father, we do thank you and we praise you for everything you've given to us and everything you've done. We thank you for your son and our savior, Jesus the Christ. We thank you for your blessings. And we pray that as we study your word today and as we look at it together that our minds are focused and our hearts are receptive and that we are ready to receive your word um, meekly knowing that it has the ability to save our souls we pray that by faith we're looking past the speaker with his weaknesses and shortcomings and looking to you knowing that everything that is good and right and eternal and true belong to you and every mistake lord that is spoken and every error lord that is not in tune with your word and, and everything that is said is not in tune with your word and that is of error is on man. Help us to remember this, Lord, and to be diligent in our own studies in Jesus' name. Amen. I wanted to, because um, it is a very intricate passage, I want to read and ask if you would uh, patiently to turn to Esther chapter 3 and let's read verses 1 through 11 again because it is a passage that is, is, has a lot there. And the points that we're going to make from it, um, we want to give a good understanding to it. Esther chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. The Bible says, After these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, son of Hamadatha the Agagite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the officials who were with him. And all the king's servants who were, with, who were at the king's gate bowed down and did obeisance to Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai did not bow down or do obeisance. Then the king's servants who were at the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why do you disobey the king's command? When they spoke to him day after day and he would not listen to them, they told Haman, in order to see whether Mordecai's words would avail, for he had told them that he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow down or do obeisance to him, Haman was infuriated, but he thought it beneath him to lay hands on Mordecai alone. So having been told who Mordecai's people were, Haman plotted to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. In the first month, which is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast per, which means the lot, before Haman for the day and for, that, for the month. And the lot fell on the thirteenth day in the, of the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar. Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered and separated among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of every other people, and they do not keep the king's laws, so that it is not appropriate for the king to tolerate them. 
If it pleases the king, let a decree be issued for their destruction, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who have charge of the king's business, so that they may put it into the king's treasuries. So the king took his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, son of Hamadatha the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. The king said to Haman, the money is given to you and the people as well to do with them as it seems good to you. Now last week's uh, study of the second chapter of Esther, we focused on young adults, if you remember, and their relationship to the world. We discussed the significance of acquiring favor and principles that lead to developing character. We focused on young adults. We saw how and we, we, we examined Esther and we looked and, and talked about how she displayed things that despite her challenges really displayed a, a dedication in, in many ways to the Lord. Now from this third chapter we see a clear and a distinct message about man. And there are a lot of things, as I have said, and, and I can say it really about every passage of scripture, it can be said truly this morning that there are a lot of lessons to be learned from the third chapter of the book of Esther. But there is a lesson that I want us to focus on that the Bible teaches concerning man and that we need to really think about. The Holy Spirit reveals the Holy Spirit reveals several ugly truths about man and his ability, meaning how man can become exceedingly corrupt and the level of depravity that man can reach. We, we see this in this particular chapter. Now, of course, I want us to understand and to remember that man is indeed capable of doing good. The fact that man is not totally depraved the Bible teaches that. We, we are evidence of that because we have obeyed the gospel. We, we can make decisions that reflect a, a certain uh, type of goodness. But I want us to understand that there are a lot of powerful lessons in the book of Esther as a whole, but most certainly in this third chapter that really talk about the depravity of man and how he can uh, grow to a, a certain level of corruption. We are reminded from this passage of the horrific things that individuals commit against others. Terrible things that human beings commit against human beings. In fact, in chapter two, uh, if you remember, we even were able to look at how Esther was treated and how many young virgin women were treated even from chapter two to really understand uh, this concept and this topic that we're discussing this morning. We're reminded again of the horrific individual uh, acts that human beings commit and sometimes even by godly people. We see that man has not changed and I want us to think about that. Man has not changed. Even today men make the same mistakes that we see in the book of Esther some 2600 years ago. The same mistakes, the same acts are committed. Now the events that are explained in chapter 3 as Bob read to us, these things take place later than the ending of chapter 2. We're not told exactly how much time between the latter part of chapter two and the beginning parts of chapter three, uh, but there has been some time that has progressed. And in this chapter, in this chapter, we are introduced to another character. And this man's name is, is Haman. He is son of Hamadatha the Agagite. That is so important. Verse one tells us that he's an Agagite. And even though the latter part of chapter two describes a plot of the on the king's life. If you look at it, we didn't talk about that last week, but there was a plot that was made uh, against the king's life and Mordecai, he thwarts that. He tells Esther about it. It's found to be true. And, and so uh, King Ahasuerus, of course, he goes on to reign and he deals with those who plotted to kill him. But Mordecai discovered this plot. However, in chapter three, the Bible says that it's, it's Haman that is awarded, not for this particular incident, but as time progresses, it is Haman that we see is given authority. In fact, he becomes second in command, and we see that in verses 1 and 2. Now, along with this new position of authority that uh, King Xerxes, or Ahasuerus, gives to Haman, he commands all the king's special servants to bow down to, and your translations may say, to do obeisance to Haman. Now, please hear and understand this as well. 
This was a way of honoring and giving recognition to Haman. But the Bible says what? That Mordecai refuses, and when he is constantly over and over questioned and exhorted even by the other king's servants, by the rest of the servants, he still refuses to obey the king's command, his, his edict, telling them and citing the reason that, that he does not obey is because he is a Jew. Now eventually, we learn in scripture that these servants tell Haman what Mordecai has been doing or what he has refused to do, how he refuses to honor Haman, and they do this, the Bible says, the reason why they do this is because they want to see how Haman will handle it. Will he allow him? Will this be a, a worthy enough excuse? Will he allow the fact that, that Mordecai is a Jew? So they wanted to see what Haman would do uh, in terms of, of hearing all of these things. And so when Haman sees this for himself, that's why the Bible says this, he is infuriated. So they get their answer. What, what does he do? He becomes infuriated and angry. But since, now listen to what the Bible says, this is important, since in his mind it is beneath him to get so angry and to get angry enough to just kill one man, what does the Bible say? Haman decides to kill not just Mordecai, he says, I'm going to kill all of the Jews. Now this is a man who in essence, if you want to understand what that means, that means that he basically thought that he was as just as high as the king, that it was beneath him to just to kill one man for this insurrection. He said, I'm going to kill all of them because I am, at, at, of course, I'm just like the king. And so this is what he determines to do. And so he, the Bible says, is what leads to all that happens in the rest of the book of Esther. Everything that we know about Esther, everything that we have read and studied, everything that was preached to us, this is where the climactic aspects come. And this is the reasons why they come. And so the rest of the book is dedicated to this particular issue, and it's important to understand all of these things. So from here, let us consider three things about man and the nature of man that we learn from this particular chapter. Number one, from this chapter and from the book of Esther, really, we learn that sometimes righteous men confuse personal interests with God's interests. Let me say that again. Sometimes even righteous people, godly people, imperfect men, but righteous, sometimes the righteous confuse personal interests with God's will. Now this has nothing to do with anyone or any specifics. We just get to God's word and we just preach God's word, whatever God's word teaches. But it's, it's a powerful lesson for us to learn today, for us to examine today. Listen, two things are certain about God that I want to start this point off with. Two things that we know are certain about God, despite what we see from man in this world. Number one, we know that our God will work out much good from the evil that men intend against his people. So when we look at the book of Esther, despite what Haman plots to do, God's going to do what? He's going to take care of his people. We as God's people, we know this and we understand this. We need to hold on to that. We need to hold on to that truth. But we know this from this book. We know this from the scriptures. We know it from our own personal life that God will work out as much good, even when men intend to do evil and harm, God will bring the good and glory from it and he will protect his people. But the second thing that we know is that he will always, always, preserve us in terms of our faith, if we allow it. So what I want us to understand about this passage of scripture is that we often assume that Mordecai's actions were righteous. And I'm going to propose something entirely different to you than you probably have contemplated, or maybe you have. Maybe Mordecai was not as righteous as we have often thought him to be. In fact, I maintain that Mordecai in this particular situation was wrong, that he was wrong. A righteous man who just chose improperly. We assume that his actions were righteous. And I think that we missed the reason that he refused to honor Haman. And that's what he was commanded to do, was to honor Haman. But the answer is found, and go, let's, let's look at verses 1 and 2 again, and we're going to do our best to, to break this down and give you some historical uh, background and give you an understanding to it. 
But verses 1 and 2 says, After these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, son of Hamadatha. That's important when the Bible says that he was the Agagite. It's important. So he's an Agagite. And advanced him and set him and has set his seat above all the officials who were with him. And all the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and did obeisance to Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him, but Mordecai did not bow down or do obeisance. And then we learn later that the reason why that he didn't do it was because he was a Jew. That's the reason. There's no other reason for us to look into it. The Bible tells us the reason why Mordecai would not bow down because he was a Jew and there's a reason that the Holy Spirit tells us that Haman's descent was from Agag who was what? An Amalekite. That's the reason. Now we, we have a tendency to think about it in, in terms of his devotion to God and I'm not saying again Mordecai was a righteous man but even righteous folk get stuff wrong. And in this case, all evidence is, is that he was wrong. These verses indicate the long history between the Jews and the Amalekites. In fact, if you look at Exodus chapter 17, it's when this history begins because the Bible says right after God gives Israel, as they're coming out of Egypt at the time of the Exodus, when God miraculously gives them water and they begin to progress and to begin to move again toward the promised land, is that as they came to Rephidim, the Amalekites did what? They attacked the Israelites. That's the biblical history behind all of it. Some seven or eight hundred years later, these two men are, are dealing with that, but seven or eight hundred years earlier, what happened is, is that as, as the Israelites were coming, <clears throat> Out of Egypt, going to the promised land, the Amalekites attacked them. Now, I want to ask you, if you would, to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 25. And we're going to take some time to get to this, but, but we have to build up to this. Deuteronomy chapter 25, and this is what happened. Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 17 through 19, it puts it this way. So God is telling Moses, as Moses is about to die, Moses is relating these things to this new generation of Israelites who are about to inherit the land. God says in verse 17, remember what Amalek did to you on your journey out of Egypt. And this is why God commanded what he did. How he attacked you on the way when you were faint and weary and struck down all who lagged behind you. He did not fear God. In other words, as they were traveling by stages, this, this great people, those who were lame, those who were tired, young children who lagged behind, who could not keep up with those who were quicker, what did Amalekite, the Amalekites do? They, they attacked them and they killed babies. They killed women. They killed the, the infirm. They killed the lame for no reason whatsoever because Israel came through their land. And so what did God say? God said, now this is important to understand it, God is the one who gives this command. This is who, how God talks about his vengeance. He says, therefore, when the Lord your God has given you rest from all your enemies on every hand and the land that the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance to possess, you shall blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven, do not forget. And so the Bible says that for generations, God would in stages do what? He would himself attack the Amalekites and utterly destroy them for what they did. What they did was egregious and immoral and God would deal with them. God would deal with them. God would execute judgment. So that's the background, that's the history. So this between Mordecai and Haman is not a battle Jew against what? Amalek. It was not nation against nation. This was a personal thing that Mordecai had against what? An Amalekite, a descendant of Agag. That's what the Bible is teaching us. That's why the Bible tells us about uh, the descent of, of Haman. Haman, however, brothers and sisters, he was one man. As corrupt as he was, he was one man. Mordecai Mordecai, Mordecai's choice seems to be based on the fact that Haman is a descendant of Agag. And we assume that the edict calls for an act of worship. That's the second thing, and that is not the case. He is simply commanded to give honor to the one that the king commanded the entire nation to give honor to. I can prove it. 
that, that just because we see in our language that someone was, was bowing down or doing obeisance, that it does not equate the same type of worship that we are supposed to give to God. For example, in, in, in 1 Samuel chapter 24, for example, turn here. We're going to work the book a, little, a lot today. 1 Samuel chapter 24. Now, this is when Saul is king and David is in danger of Saul trying to take his life. Look at verse number 8. David had already rebuked his men for trying to do what? For talking about and trying to encourage him to take the life of God's anointed. In verse 8, so David, verse 7, scolded his men severely and did not permit them to attack Saul. Verse 8 says, afterwards, David also rose up and went out of the cave and called after Saul, my lord and king. Respect and honor that's given there. My lord, the king. When Saul looked behind him, David did what? Does your Bible say that? Bowed down, bowed his face to the ground, and did obeisance. There is a type of honor that the scriptures say that man can give to man that is not equated with worship. And this is what is being conveyed, I believe, in the book of Esther. It was personal for Mordecai. He may have believed that what he was doing was right, but in this particular instance, all evidence points to Mordecai being wrong. See, biblically, righteous men did a type of obeisance that honored men, but it was not worship. This is what it seems concerning the edict that was commanded. But Mordecai refused and even reveals that it was because the two peoples were enemies. But this was between two men. This is not an instance where God is going to, to destroy Amalek because this is just one man. This is personal. Mordecai was a good man, and I want to state that. He was a righteous man, but he allowed his view and his understanding confuse him concerning God's will, and he even allowed his personal judgment affect his responsibility to the governing authorities. We do that sometimes as, as righteous people. We make those mistakes, and sometimes we can believe that we're doing God's will, and in essence, we are actually violating God's commandments. We have to have proper judgment. See, this teaches us that even righteous men are capable of making unrighteous judgments when our understanding, when our understanding and our thinking is lacking. I believe we could equate what Mordecai did to a Christian being under the authority, maybe at work, to an atheist or to someone that's an unbeliever. Now, because that person is an atheist, does that mean that when they give me some type of command at work that because they're an atheist, do I disobey it? Or do I show them the honor of having authority over me and, and despite what their, politic, their, their spiritual or religious thinking is, do I honor God by honoring the authority that they have over me? This is really what equivalent, what's equivalent to what Mordecai did. He based it on something that was personal, thinking that it was God's will, and in essence, he was the one who violated God's command. He refused to comply with what was, what was given because of, of the background of, of Haman. So even the Lord Jesus, and this is something important, and I think it goes to what we talked about this morning. Even the Lord Jesus did things to maintain peace. To maintain peace. Not raising unnecessary objections for the sake of personal righteousness. What Mordecai did was that he raised a personal uh, objection out of his righteousness that brought trouble. Because as you can see from what he decided to do, now the whole Jewish nation is under the eye of a man who has the authority to do what? To kill them. All because of how Mordecai viewed himself. And what he believed, I believe, ignorantly, was God's will. See, we can sometimes raise objections that, are, that do more harm than good. And we really ought to contemplate what is necessary in just showing wisdom. Sometimes it's better to just simply say, you know what, I may not agree with this, but if I do this, this is going to lead to this, and this is going to lead to this. It's really not what they're asking me to do. It's not a violation of God's word. And so it would be more beneficial for God's glory, for the better of everyone else, if I just, just comply or just do this. And, and this is what, if Mordecai had done it, now God would have carried out his will in another way, but his will would have been carried out. 
But Mordecai, God is going to protect his people, but Mordecai, he could have shown a lot more wisdom. We learn that from this, that even righteous folk make those mistakes. But we also learn that God will bring glory to himself even out of our failings. Because God is going to allow these things that have been set in motion to bring glory. Mordecai's decision, though, please understand this, ignited the anger out of an already proud and corrupt man. You can see the scriptures tell us that Haman didn't even know initially that Mordecai was a Jew. Now, again, for lack of a better term, who, who had the beef? Who started with the personal? It was Mordecai in this instance. It was not until Haman learns what he is that he says, okay, if that's their attitude, I'm going to destroy what? All of the Jews. But it ignited the anger out of this already proud, already a corrupt man. You, you just don't agitate a man like Haman when it's not necessary. But God was going to allow his people to be preserved. He would not let them be destroyed completely. That's the first thing that we learn, that even though we are uh, righteous folk through Christ Jesus, that we still have to walk in wisdom. But number two, what we learn from this passage is that much of the misery caused in the world is done by a few people. Much misery is done by a few people. Again, let's go back to Esther and look at verses 5 through 10 very quickly. It says, when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow down or do obeisance to him, Haman was infuriated. But he thought it beneath him to lay hands on Mordecai. In other words, he says, I'm such a, a man of prestige and, and of royal dignity that to kill one man is, is just beneath me. I'll kill an entire group of people. Having been told who Mordecai's people were, Haman plotted to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. In the first month, which is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast per, which means the lot, before Haman for the day and for the month, and the lot fell on the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar. Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, there's a certain, so he puts it in the heart of the king, and then what has happened? He gets permission from the king with all the money that is needed and all the people that are needed to do what? To destroy the Jews. Much of the misery that is caused in the world is done by a few people. Here it is, this man, Haman, who wants to destroy an entire people. Now, 20 years ago, yesterday, 2,996 people in total on that day were killed, 9-11, 20 years ago. Many husbands lost wives. Many wives lost husbands. Many children lost parents, and some parents lost children of, of all ages on 9-11, 20 years ago. And those attacks that affected and changed the entire nation, not just those families that were impacted by death, but in changing our entire nation. We've become accustomed to what happened on 9-11. It's, it's affected the whole nation, and in some ways you can say even the world. And those attacks, have changed a lot. But think about it. 2,900 people, over 2,900 people killed that day, not to mention those that went into the towers and then developed sicknesses and illnesses and that have died, not to mention all, again, all of the people that have lost loved ones that are still affected, that every year that this anniversary rolls around, they, they contemplate what they have lost, and forever they will be affected. And when you think about it, only a handful of men got in those planes and crashed those planes that have affected so many people. It only takes a few to bring great damage and to bring great harm to many. History bears witness to the impact that just one or two or a few people that have power and that have immoral character, how they can impact the many. Think about Hitler, it was one man. One man who had a, a corrupt and an immoral vision and look at over six million Jews were killed. Think about Stalin and all of the millions that, that, that he killed. And we could go on and on, of course, historically. But think about what history teaches us about man. Think about what the Bible is telling. Here's Haman. This man wants to, and if God had not intervened, he would have destroyed all of the Jews under this particular kingdom. This one man, one man. 
And I, we ought to really think about that. Think about that history teaches us about man and what we are capable of doing, what we are willing to do as human beings. There have been men throughout history. There are men that exist today, and until the Lord comes back, there will always be men that believe that they are so important, so important that they are so deceived by their pride that the casualties that result from their aim and from their ambition that they don't matter. If I have to kill two million people for this cause, because it's me, it doesn't matter. If there are 10 million folk, it doesn't matter. To some folk, it doesn't matter because to them, it is worth it. All of the casualties are worth it. And there will always be men like that. And that's what we learn from this chapter as well. See, Haman believed that he was such an important man and that he was so worthy of honor that when Mordecai refused to honor him, that any and all people that believe like Mordecai deserve death. Those type of folk deserve to die. Haman was willing to destroy an entire group of people because of his self-importance, and his self-importance blinded him. When a man is filled with so much pride, or when a man believes that his self-interests are worthy of extermination, of an entire group of people, or anyone for that matter, that man's conscience has been seared like a hot iron. The book of Proverbs, chapter 16, verse 18, tells us that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. And the reality is, is that the wise man is talking about the individual who carries pride in his heart. But before the person that has pride falls and is destroyed, many times they have already brought a bunch of destruction and hurt on people already. They've already done a lot of destruction outwardly before God has to destroy their aim and their purpose. This speaks, this chapter does, and Proverbs speaks to the individual. But oh, how great the damage that is done to others before that ruin that the wise man describes. See, there are American politicians, and I don't want to offend anybody. I just want to speak God's truth and prepare us to understand these things. Don't you understand that there are American politicians right now in Washington that are making decisions right now solely to serve their own interests? They'll tell you that it's for you, but they're there to serve their own interests. They don't care how many folk it affects in reality. They don't care how many people will die because of those policies because they are so arrogant and so proud. They believe that this decision, my interests, that I am important enough that if there has to be casualties, then let the casualties fall. Thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and yes, even millions of lives are greatly impacted by folk that are in Washington right now, whether they're little babies or whatever it may be. Hurt, ruined, and some lives are even ended because they are only in politics to serve themselves. It's because of the self-absorbed individuals that we have hunger in this world, there's no need to have hunger. We have hunger because people are self-important. We have poverty, not because God has not provided enough in this world. We have poverty because man is self-absorbed. We have disease, not because God has not provided man wisdom to take care of these things. It's because man is self-absorbed. We have wars where young men and young women are dying, not because they have to be fought, but because man is self-absorbed. And even forms of murder, because man is self-absorbed all because these individuals believe that their interests are worthy of all of the casualties and all of the lives and all of the blood that is spilt. We learn that from the book of Esther. But the church, the church is not exempt either. We may not shed blood from a physical standpoint, but let me tell you, in my 30-something years as a Christian, I've known men in the Lord's church. And leadership is sometimes not out not in leadership. Out of all the congregations that I've been a part of, and there haven't been many, but it just goes to show you the condition that we even the church will, will fall to. Men that believe that if they were not in positions, if I'm not an elder, if I'm not the preacher, if I'm not in leadership, this church will fall. And they will do things that they believe 
because they are so self-absorbed that they've convinced themselves that they're doing the right thing, but actually it hurts the church. They were only serving their own interests, their own decisions, and just like we see in the natural, in a spiritual sense, these men who believe that they are Jesus or equivalent, that they are needed. If I'm not here, if I'm not in this position, this whole church will fall apart. And because of these, these self-absorbed, proud men, there has been spiritual hunger in the Lord's church in that congregation. There has been spiritual poverty. There's been spiritual disease, wars caused by these men. And even death. See, we have, have a tendency in the Lord's church to think that if a church is, if folk are still gathering, that that church is strong and that it's healthy and that it's sound. That's not the case. There are a lot of churches that are ruined where people are still gathering. And because there are self-absorbed men, folk are all over the place spiritually, dead and sick and hurting and not knowing what to do because of such men. The church isn't exempt. And we see this. In the Lord's church, we see it. This is why we need to be different in the Lord's church. And then number three, from this passage of scripture, see, remember that one or a few men can cause pain and hurt to the many. But number three, from this passage, we learn that corrupt men are often successful by using others. By using others. Let's look at verses 12 through 15. It's a powerful lesson. We didn't read these verses, but as it progresses, that's what the Bible says. Then the king's secretaries were summoned on the 13th day of this first month, and an edict, according to all that Haman commanded, was written to the king's satraps and to the governors of, over all the provinces and to the officials of all the, the peoples, to every province in its own script and every people in its own language. It was written in the name of King Ahasuerus and sealed with the king's ring. In other words, all of these nations that were under his kingdom, they wrote into their language what Haman was given the authority to do to destroy the Jews. If you live next to a Jew, there's going to come a time when you can get, kill them. And then look at what the Bible says. Look at what the remainder of it all is. Letters were sent to couriers to all the king's provinces, giving orders to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all Jews, young and old, women and children, in one day, the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. Now look at what the Bible says. A copy of the document was to be issued as a decree in every province by proclamation, calling on all the peoples to be ready for that day. The couriers went quickly by order of the king, and the decree was issued in the citadel of Susa. Now look at the last line of this chapter. You ever notice that? Look at that last line. The king and Haman, they didn't guard, they didn't arm themselves. Did Haman arm himself? Did Haman put the sword, did the Bible say that he put his sword on his side? No, the Bible says the king, the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was thrown into confusion. Tell me that didn't happen today. Tell me God's word is not timeless. And I'm going to say it to you again. Corrupt men are often successful by bringing others to do their bidding. There are folk, whether you look at it politically or religiously in the church, that will do things because that one person or two people, and they have the whole church fighting. The whole nation is fighting. Whether it's wealthy folk, isn't that what James says? The wealthy folk will have folk that are not like them in terms of economic status. And here you have, again, as I've said over and over again, people who are more similar economically, and yet you have folk that, that are fighting one another. While wealthy people are the ones that have spread the seeds of discord amongst us. That's just the nature of man. We see it in the world. We see it on the job. We see it even in the church, and these folks sit back and let everything burn. This is what we learn from the book of Esther. The corrupt men are often successful. And listen how, they, how, how Haman puts it. He says, listen, when you kill these Jews, you know what you can do? He gave them a little incentive. If you take a house and you destroy the Jews in that house, you can have everything in that house. He made certain promises that appealed to them. Same thing happens today. If I can get you to believe 
that if you kill this person, your life is going to be better, that if you fight this person, if you hate this person, your life will be better. If you buy into that, then you've made us enemies. You've made enemies. See, I want you to notice again that there's a lure of wealth in verse 13. But also notice in verse 15 again that the king and Haman, they're celebrating this plan. So what's my word of conclusion to you, Christian? The concluding thoughts are these. Remember that the love of the world is what causes men to be used by corrupt men. See, a corrupt man cannot use you if you're not in love with this world. And when you see religious people who are fighting earthly battles, it's because they are in love with this world. But a man who loves the Lord, a woman who has put the Lord first, they cannot be corrupted by the offerings of this world. They cannot be. They cannot be bought by the material things in this world. The love of this world is what causes men to be used. Religious men, good men even, to be corrupted by corrupt men themselves already. We should not be deceived by the ideas that corrupt men give to us, whether they are politicians, whether they are so-called preachers, whether they are so-called leaders, whatever it is, don't let corrupt men give you the ideas that will ultimately corrupt you. And then remember that unspiritual men are the ones that bring problems in the church, too. Unspiritual men. Don't listen to unspiritual men who will tell you that this is how you profit. This is how you, you gain. No, our idea ought to be God's glory, God's honor. And when we do that, God will, will bless us. I hope you've seen that men have not changed. The only thing that keeps us from the same corrupt attitude is the Lord Jesus Christ. If it were not for his grace, and sometimes we step outside of that grace, even as his children, and we fall victim to some of these same things, let it be said today that we will all serve the Lord. The way that it ought to have been, Rob brought up that point, the way that we all ought to end that. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's how that ought to end every time. If you're here this morning and you have not obeyed the gospel, whether you're here or whether you're listening virtually, we want to urge you to obey the gospel today through faith, repentance, confession, and being baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins. God promises upon your obedience to the gospel that on that day when he receives his own to himself that he will give you the crown of life that no man can take away provided you walk faithfully unto death. Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. And if you are a Christian and you need to come for the reasons that we spoke of or for anything else, why don't you come right now while we all together stand and while we sing.
Let us pray. Your most gracious Lord, we come to you now, thanking you for blessing us with another day. Thank you for allowing us to study another portion of your word and just being here to worship you, Lord. We thank you for the privilege of worshiping you. We pray that everything we did today has brought honor and glory to your name and everything we did today is pleasing to your sight. We pray that as we go throughout our lives that we don't let this world corrupt us and that we always stick to your word and we always live our lives in such a way to bring honor and glory to your name and, and to bring the corrupt to you. We pray that, that we are examples to everyone that is not in your, in your church. We pray that that we are able to to bring light in this world. We pray that you be with all of us as we leave this place, that we go our separate ways. We pray that you be with us, keep us safe, and please be with us until the next appointed time. We pray that you be with anyone that is sick and suffering. Please heal them. Please comfort them, Lord, and have them realize that that you are the ultimate giver and that you can do anything. We pray that you be with people that are struggling spiritually or just struggling in any way that you comfort them. We pray that as a congregation that we comfort them. We Thank you for your son and the sacrifice that he's given us. And we thank you for the chance of eternal life. Pray that you forgive us for our many sins and shortcomings. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>